Golovanov stream number 29, part 2. All right, next question from viewers. Alexei, on the verge of special operation of Kremlin, Maidan 3, uh, please advise how do we not fall prey to that PSYOP? Well, there are no perspectives for that Maidan, for that Maidan 3 PSYOP. So, if, if it exists, if that plan exists, it would only show how far removed from reality Kremlin is. And if it doesn't, then it looks more like a clumsy attempt to somehow explain whether Ukrainian president is going to be legitimate or not after May. And this uh, discussion showed up in public space, indicating that they're really concerned about their legitimacy if the elections are not held, when they're not held. And then they're, they're calling probably Maidan 3, um, any resistance or any pushback from the society. I don't think anyone in Ukraine will be falling for another Maidan with us fighting for our life at the war, with all the difficulties we're going through. I don't think we can find people who would say, let's remove the power by force or by global protests. Right? I can be criticizing president's office from here till seven years ahead, but I would be against forced removal of uh, current power, because that would probably lead to the collapse of the country. So, whoever is pushing this topic, whoever is propagating this agenda, um, it's either a treacherous uh, maneuver or they're so far removed from reality. And how do you bring people out, right, regardless of how many pumps you make in the information space? Everybody will be bubbling on the, in on the inside and in the internet. Um, that's not how you actually realize these things. I don't think you should worry about Maidan 3. When you ask a question how to not become the victim of manipulation, if you become a victim of manipulation, what you'll do? You'll take a rifle and go remove president? No, you'll just stay in uh, the internet and your account and probably will be posting things online, right? So, yeah, so it wouldn't... Maidan 3 is not a thing. Um, another question from viewer. Why did Carlson laugh about Putin's interview? Well, he didn't really laugh about the whole interview. He laughed about an episode about Putin's statement that there are fascists in Ukraine. He thought it's, uh, it's hilarious. And he has a very good argumentation. He said that Nazism is, the, is applicable to a certain regime in the history of Germany. And that term can be used only towards a certain regime that ruled in Germany for about 16 years in the middle of the 20th century. For other situations and regimes and governments, one should look for different words, because first of all, it reveals the projection of Putin's hatred towards Ukraine. It's not true, and it's a wrong use of uh, vocabulary. So that's his estimation of this uh, segment. And when Lex Friedman asked him why did not he say that to Putin's face, he answered that Putin was producing such a wave of uh, communication that it was very difficult to pause uh, that with a small dam of my questions. So he listened to everything and now he gave his review to his interview. Um, so speaking in common parlance, uh, Putin was producing such a wave of BS that it was uh, really useless to try to stop that. And he let him vent and then now he is giving a judgment to the interview. So Alexei, now the question. Do you think there is any probability for air transport to return back to Ukraine? Well, Vasily, if the uh, United States is not going to send us support, then any means will be good to have. Boats, planes, trains, automobiles. And frankly, we can only be talking about airports where the time to the border is about two minutes, right? Probably Ushgarad airport is the best candidate for this but it's not useful for receiving heavy passenger planes. It's got a smaller runway. Could have we bettered it? We could. I think during the whole war, Zakarpatia was hit only once. It has very specific terrain, big chance of missing, and Russia is also playing game with Orban in some, to some degree, so attacking Zakarpatia much is not too beneficial for them. So. We can ask why we're we talking about restarting Barispal airport, but we're not talking about the only good variant 
in uh, Ushgorod and Zakarpatia. We even talked about Lvov airport, but that was also hit by Russia. So one would need to better the runway, um, install certain defense measures. Israelis were uh, consulting us on these matters. They, by the way, never cease uh, the work of the airports even during the hot um, segments of their war with Hamas or anybody else. So they never stop it. So we could, we could have done it. We haven't. So you're concerned about Lvov that it's not doable there, right? Lvov was already hit several times. Ushgorod was not. So, Alexei, do you know what is used to shoot down Russian planes, Russian jets? You do not need to say, but uh, just a wink, a nod in the right direction. I do know, but I will not tell you, right? Because I can, if I nod, I basically reveal it. Okay, you're robbing the viewer from the answer. Um, yeah, sorry. Um, next question. In 2024, do you think Ukrainians will be coming back home from Europe? Well, it's an ongoing process. Um, people are saying, and some stats show that a pretty big part of our compatriots come back. The exact data is up to statistics, and uh, we can probably ask for more data from the border guards of Ukraine. And we've seen some data indicating that more coming back than leaving. But still, however you spin it, um, we still have about a third of our population still living in Europe and also in Belarus and in Russia. You should not forget about that. Russian numbers, I think the lower bracket is one and a half. 2.8 is their average statement and uh, nobody knows in reality, but it's another big um, group. Regardless, about a third of them are outside Ukraine still. Well, part of them have nowhere to return, right? Indeed, their houses were destroyed or their, their property is somewhere in the vicinity of the front line, like Kharkov. It's still functioning and standing, right? But we all know that it's uh, like that only because they got balls of steel there, because the city is being attacked daily. And one thing is when you're staying in Kharkov, when you made a strategic decision to stay regardless, and the other proposition is to bring back a mom with young children from Europe, where for two years her kids were going to school and adapting. Just imagine that. 14, 16, maybe, right? But if the kids are six to eight, so they left when they were six and now they're eight. They left when the kid was a kindergartner and now he spent or she two years in school with the local language and learning. And now you would make a decision to go back to the city that is being shelled daily. That that would be a difficult decision. Do you think Europeans are interested in Ukrainians staying in Europe? They, uh, Vasil, divided our citizens into two categories. One of them is uh, those who work well, who adapt well, those are desirable citizens, and the others who are using subsidies and uh, state support, they're not so desirable. So that's why when you hear propositions, we'll give you $1,500, $2,000, just leave back to Ukraine. And um, yeah, they're very logical in a way, very utilitarian approach, if not to use expletives. Nothing um, of solidarity or support is there. They're not talking about that. They're just saying that Ukraine, take back the bad ones, uh, we'll keep the best over here. And that's why you hear these suggestions. So they're supporting some, those who are proactive and who are assimilating well, and then they're pushing out the ones who are not. Poland recently voted, right, that um, on the bill that has a statement, if you left for Ukraine at least once during a certain period, you will never be granted the citizenship in Poland. So they're cutting off those people who still maintain some loyalty to Ukraine and keep ties with Ukraine. They're trying to cut them off. So, Alexey, about non-Poland. Right, so they're facing hard choices there. Other countries, Germany, France, Italy, Ireland, they're a good uh, support for our migrants there, for our refugees. What do you think will happen there? Oh, support will be dwindling, and usually it'll be coming in autumn, September, October, November, when they're discussing next fiscal year, and they'll be reviewing it. By this time, it would be a third year of adaptation. Those who could have, have already assimilated, learned the language, married, found jobs, 
uh, birthed some kids, so it will be probably a larger question, are they Ukrainian citizens? It will be a personal choice of uh, each of those citizens, but their loyalty will probably be split between the local place and Ukraine, which is still hanging by a thread. And they, being in Europe, they very keenly aware that the destiny of Ukraine is hanging by a thread. Uh, question from viewer. Do you have an idea, Alexei, to create a larger community in the world to be able to influence uh, things uh, in relation to Ukraine? Uh, I actually do have this community. Uh, my graduates from my school, Apeiron, we are in uh, dozens of countries around the world, different people from different walks of life. There are people who barely remember Russian language and use translators during the classes, and there are others who came there recently, different caliber, from students to people who are well integrated into academia or political spheres of their countries. So we do have a rather big influence already. If you want to, you can join. We have communities in the cities, governments, continents based. I recently met American Epiron graduates, I met uh, European graduates. Our people are everywhere. So you would understand we already uh, noted uh, 21 marriages and weddings among our students um, throughout the world. So you recently had a speech in uh, Princeton. It was not exactly a lecture, lecture right, Vasil? I was invited by a couple of American prestigious universities. I will not be giving both names. But when the public lecture was announced, there were two big scandals. And there were four major groups uh, protesting my presence. One of them is uh, supporting Palestine because they know my attitude towards Israel and the Palestinian conflict. I'm trying to be objective, but I, there is something to criticize both each side for, but I'm generally supportive of Israel. Second group was feminists, who remember that uh, fabricated scandal about strangling supposedly women. And then there was, of course, some representatives of pro-Putin's Russian diaspora. And they were also Ukrainians, very, uh, in quotes, patriotic Ukrainians who were threatening universities. Um, losing cooperation with them, etc. Princeton was not scared by that. They said we're a big research center, so we don't care. We allow different speakers here. I told them uh, to give it a thought. They took some time, changed their tone, but said we're still not afraid. And then I suggested in order to not bring you onto the target, into the crosshairs, I'll meet a very uh, narrow professional community. And we had uh, specialists who are specializing in political studies and Russian studies. On this uh, meeting, there were students, teachers, professors, and uh, military who are also studying in Princeton now. So we met with three different groups, had a very lively discussion, and uh, we promised to meet again. I have another offer from a different university, also Ivy League level. I'm just not saying, I'm usually not announcing until things happen. If it happens, I will disclose, and this institute already is aware of the protests and stuff. They're saying that they're not afraid of them. They have a different history. But uh, of course, uh, the biggest protesting group is Ukrainians. For some of them, it is so important for Ukraine to not be presented on the international arena. But if they are presented, then only by whom they like and not such scoundrels as Aristovich. But I want to say that there are several surprises for them in store. Regardless of their struggles, they'll have to see me on a few very prestigious platforms soon. Where do you spend more time now, Alexei? In the United States or Europe? I'm everywhere, Vasil. I don't have a specific goal to be in a certain geographic location. I'm going where I'm being called to, and it's been uh, roughly every three days I'm changing uh, location, being called to different forums, uh, meetings, and it's a kaleidoscope of events and moves this year. But I'm generally satisfied. I kind of like this endless nomadism, so to say. Don't you get tired after a certain amount of these breakfasts in the hotel? I am following that uh, proverb, right? The paratrooper runs as much as he can and then as much as is needed. Um, yeah, although breakfast, they do cause a pause when I'm seeing the same set of breakfast uh, menus all over the world. But um, yeah, I, I do miss my mom's cooking, but um, you know, it's it's all for the 
good. It's all for the good of our country. Centers like Princeton are places where the future influence is being developed, where uh, think tanks work. And I'm using this opportunity for 120% to make sure that we send the right message. People are asking in the commentary, what is burning in Crimea? Is it an oil transfer? Not a refinery, but oil transfer, like pipeline? Um, that's not to me. That's a question to Budanov. Ask him. Budanov, Maluk, Defense Forces of Ukraine, they know better what happened. Ask me about other things, because uh, some of the things I only know from the open sources. Russians said that there was a strike yesterday, that they intercepted 38 UAVs, and if they are acknowledging that 38 were intercepted, that means it was a large-scale operation, and that means something did reach its goal. And Crimea is essentially a land-based aircraft carrier, you can think of it like this. And there are a lot of targets in Crimea. There are different groups of uh, military, there are warehouses, fuel, command centers. There is always a target there to hit. All right. Hello from Latvia, Alexei. How possible do you think the scenario when Russia would place nukes in Crimea and on Donbass? I think it already is in Crimea. I don't see them doing it in Donbass, though. If it exists already in Belarus, it's much closer to Kiev from Belarus than from Donbass. Just give it a thought. It's in Kaliningrad region, it's in Belarus, and it's much closer to different centers in Ukraine than Donbass. And I think they probably have something in Crimea as well. Um, why West is not disclosing the results of investigation of the Nord Stream? Well, that's a big question, Vasil. All people engaged, including Russian side, were mumbling about the results. Putin once mentioned to Tucker in his interview, you Americans blew it up, without presenting any proof or any data by his uh, courts or anything, or investigators. But the fact that other countries refused the investigation, um, under, or they gave investigation to police, but police is very limited to investigate what happened at the depth of 150 yards over a year ago when the interests of power players are involved. So, and without real, real uh, ironclad data, it's very difficult to prove anything. Otherwise, it goes very quickly into the land of conspiracy. And I don't want to discuss that because it's at this point is really conspiracy. If uh, the viewer asked me about my estimation on a certain theory, then I could comment, but in, in general, no. Alexei, what do you think will happen with Kharkov? Well, right now, Russia does not have a group that could threaten Kharkov. Plus, they are afraid that we might go into some counter-offensive on Belgrade direction near presidential reaffirmation, so-called elections in Russia. And that might indicate Putin's weakness. So they've dropped a couple more brigades of uh, their National Guard, and they're just covering the border. They are the forces that are good enough to cover the border, but not good enough to do any offensive operations. So, uh, however, Russians are still building reserves, diligently, steadily, and of course now they're being burnt in the south, in the southern areas near Avdiivka of the front, but under certain conditions they can create such a group. But creation of such a group uh, is a lengthy process, it takes times, and we'll be able to see that in advance, and then if we see that we'll uh, indicate that the level of threat to Kharkov by the ground had increased. When that happens we'll warn our viewers, but for now there is no risk. Since about 23rd, 24th of February, different monitoring groups were saying that Russians are ready for a massive missile strike, similar to what they carried out during the new year. Today is already the beginning of March, but uh, there was still no major aerial strike. Do you think it's due to us hitting their A-50 co communication uh, uh, plane, coordination plane, command plane for the aerial attacks? Um, there are different reasons for that, Vasil. Probably, yes, it did have some effect that we destroyed the A-50 twice already. And um, also, they also running out of uh, winter time, so they cannot freeze anybody, right, with that hit. 
Um, moreover, this winter they concentrated mostly on our industrial capacity, on our military industrial capacity. They were hitting their warehouses and production facilities, and they had partial success, by the way. Um, so they usually use Intel services to target, to, to figure out which targets they're hitting. And we also took some measures to hide our targets. And my theory is that they are still aggregating the targets they want to hit, but they don't have a bank large enough to hit. Once they confirm the areas they want to hit, that's when it likely will happen. Also, it's possible that right now there may be some period of threats towards Europe and they need to have a certain missile potential to be able to threaten Europe as well, to add weight to their threats. Because if they wasted everything in Kyiv, um, there is nothing to threaten Europe with, right? They need to threaten Swedes, uh, French, Germans by potential cruise missile strike, right? And it's difficult to threaten when you just expanded everything in Ukraine, then you have nothing to threat uh, those countries with, so to threaten. They might also want to create a few additional scandals in Europe on the eve of presidential elections. They also perhaps are struggling now with the blowback from Navalny's funeral, when they were accused that they are Satanists and not giving uh, his mother uh, the body. So there is also now the backdrop of Odessa, where they hit uh, civilians at large, and uh, it's a bad element of their campaign. But um, they may be taking a pause. But I think the main reasons are two. First, the bank of targets. I don't think it's fully assembled yet for this round. With all our deficiencies after our warehouses and military objects were hit, I think even we took certain measures and uh, it's not so clear now where to hit or if to hit there it's not worth it because everything is dispersed and um, second probably they're getting ready to blackmail europe better so they want to stockpile a better potential for that okay another question from you were in case if russian troops will enter transnistria and will be attacking ukraine from there what will be the response um, how do you think they'll get there? I have a question. If we're talking Transnistria, how do how do you get there? You need to walk through sovereign state of Moldova or sovereign state of Ukraine. We will not let them in Ukraine and um, Moldova. Well, they're sovereign state, which is very friendly with Romania. And by the way, Romanians, they do think that Moldova is essentially the same people like them. And they will not be doing nothing and twiddling their fingers if uh, Russians will be threatening Moldova in some capacity. Ukraine doesn't have another ally supporting us at the moment who would think that we're pretty much the same people. We have a couple countries that think that, but they're on the other side, uh, Belarus and Russia. They are attacking us. Right, or they're allowing Russia to attack us as Belarus under Lukashenko. But... Um, Romania does think Moldova to be part of its own, so they would not allow, I think, Russia to bring anything there. And they have some troops, they have 18,000 troops there. Um, those uh, thousand and a half of Russian troops in uh, Transnistria, those are basically local citizens with Russian passports who live there, who just serve in local military, but their battle readiness is very limited. And even though since 2016 Russians consider that to be a third army corps, given that Lugansk and Donbass are the first and the second, it doesn't have a potential. They may have the intent, but they don't have military potential to threaten anything. So Transnistria will remain a problem, but at most it will uh, just cause us to keep a dozen or a couple dozen thousand troops next to it. The problem would be if Russia decides to adjoin it to the Russian territory, right? There are different enclaves here and there voicing the, their concerns that they want to join Russia proper. So uh, closer to Putin's elections, they're talking about that more and more. Then Russia starts to say that, okay, this is our territory and we'll be defending it as our enclave middle, in the middle of enemies. And then it becomes the zone of potential conflict with Moldova and become... Uh, special 
point of uh, possible inflammation on the border of Ukraine. But um, we understand that we cannot take full measures there. And um, in the meantime, Transnistria people and armed forces, pro-Russian forces, understand that if they become too hot of a problem, then Ukraine will probably find enough uh, battalions and enough diesel to go there and take care of it. So I suspect they're mostly threatening in the political sphere, not in the actual military sphere. But again, if those uh, troops of Transnistria will go towards Moldova, then that may be a threat. But uh, there is Romania there, and I think we will be able to provide some aid as well, if that happens. The def deficiency of democracy is they, they consult for too long, but I hope that uh, Moldova will be able to protect itself from Transnistria should they decide to inflame something and turn into a hot conflict. Um, I okay, suggest once again to our viewers to click that like button, to not forget to subscribe to Alexis' channel, to my channel, and of course to the privateer station if you are listening or watching that in English. Alexei, in your view, why Navalny's funeral was uh, such a long story, such a big ordeal? His body was not given to his mom and um, was released on the final hour of uh, the legal window for as long as they could hold it. So now media are saying that there were over 10,000 people coming to the funeral. And uh, why do you think it didn't become an um, igniter for the revolt in Moscow? What igniter can we talk about in Moscow? Even Prigozhin's push failed to ignite anything. He had a real force that actually was marching to Moscow. They shot seven jets down. They destroyed several barricades by National Guard. According to some data, several brigades turned to him to his side and several others declared neutrality. So during war times, that's uh, essentially a treason. He had a huge potential and people still didn't uprise. And if you're talking about peaceful protest, expressing solidarity that uh, are nice to our ear, it doesn't have a potential against a huge police machine that Putin is uh, regularly exercising against them. And he still has a large enough group supporting him in Russia, unfortunately, and they don't like Navalny and his supporters. So those people who came to the funeral, they did a very brave thing. They actually knew that they will be noted, that their names will be somewhere in the FSB records, but they still had enough bravery to come out and support Navalny publicly. right? But they still found the church that uh, led this last uh, funeral uh, proceedings and they found the funeral services that uh, afforded for transportation and all. So there are some forces of power in Kremlin. One of them is pure Satanist style, the other is uh, somewhat reasonable and I think the more reasonable prevailed saying that okay let them bury him in the meantime we'll take their faces and take notes. But they don't have enough fuel to fight against um, Putin's regime. We can just say that uh, the more realistic part in Putin's government prevailed over the purely Satanist part. But what can a citizen do in Russia? Nothing really at this point, especially with peaceful protests. They can leave, right? Yeah, exactly. They can leave and protest. That's the maximum of protest they can allow. Even if a citizen finds a rifle somewhere and shoots a couple of policemen um, or Putin's uh, soldiers, he'll be a, a loner and he'll die quickly. So it's a very difficult choice, not for everybody and not for the mass movement in Russia. Russia does not have a potential for mass protest yet, unfortunately. Why are you saying yet? What can change it? Well, because life shows different things. Right. Life keeps moving things. Each society has a potential for civil war. For one reason, because uh, there are a lot more reasons disconnecting people than connecting, joining people. But what it will be in real life, we don't know. We'll see. For now, a real serious number of Russians are supporting Putin's politics, and they don't like the part of Russians who do not support him. The difference is that the first group has a big police apparatus and regime behind them. On the side of the others, there is nothing. It's just them facing the oppression and all the mechanisms that Putin installed there. Karamurza is in jail, Navalny was killed, many others are in jail. And this potential generally exists, but the conditions are not there yet. 
Remember in the Strugatsky's inhabited island, who will rise? The army is mobilized, unknown fathers are healthy, and the ray meters are fine, so nobody is going to do the uprising. Classics, right? What do you think about Yulia Navalny? I think she's uh, picked by the West as the cult figure. The size of symbolic investments in her is beyond any limits, and she's being received on the highest level in Europe, in, Europe, in Parliament, in Washington. Right, even Biden received her, right, the President of the United States. I meant, um, I meant the whole complex of meetings that she held there. So, understandably, she is a symbolic figure for the West. On the one hand, it tells a lot about the West, because they do like to work with symbols rather than with practice, because the moment you start asking them about practical aspect of support, you know, you may find out that she may get a dozen million dollars to distribute among the opposition and perhaps do the information campaign against Putin's regime. But that's about it. That's only if somebody will dive deeper into how that works. Um, I am just supposing I do not have the data. And there is an attempt to try to pump her up as the real figure who might lead the opposition, which is now very broken apart. It's still a big question, remains to be seen if she will be able to take this position, this uh, spot. Because uh, Navalny supporters, they're not necessarily part of the current Russian opposition gathering actively outside of the country. Uh, when I was in Brussels on the gathering, Navalny group wasn't even presented there. So, as in any politics, once you're a big enough figure, you can start influencing things and then perhaps you can materialize more support eventually. And I did ask her a question. Uh, it's an open question to her out in the stream and the media. Does she understand that since she picked up the banner, decided to pick up the banner of Alexei Navalny, that her success and the success of Russian opposition at large depends a lot on the success of Ukrainian defense forces, because their chances to win will be zero. If uh, we fail, uh, they will be much stronger, almost 100% if we win, and uh, will be questionable if it will be a stalemate on the front. So aid to Ukraine, the problem of continuous military support to Ukraine is a key to support Russian opposition too. So right now she has a huge political capital and some people, some commentators already coming out here in Ukraine speaking that Yulia Navalny for the West costs more than uh, several children killed in Odessa by Russian UAVs and Western media is full of Yulia Navalny. I don't support um, these statements about the death of children and comparing that to her political capital, but it exists, unfortunately. So she owns a lot of political capital of Alexei and uh, She's uh, getting a momentum now. I think the main thing she can do, a very important thing she, she can do right now, is to support Ukraine uh, military. Because this is a preemptive condition for success of Yulia's work, of all the opposition that Russia has inside and outside of the country. And this is a direct important factor to that success. That's why I, again, in the public uh, square, openly appealing to Yulia to bring up the matter of continuous military support to Ukraine. I think this is one of the best things you can do at the moment. By the way, this is what Nemtsov's daughter was talking about. If you want to, um, if you want to avenge Navalny and um, get back with Putin, you need to provide more military aid to Ukraine. Yes, I am of the same opinion. So. It would be good if she doesn't squander her political capital on other minor things. That could be one of the major statements that she makes now. Do you think Navalny treats Ukraine rather in a rather cold fashion? When uh, they were being at the Oscar award ceremony, they did not mention Ukraine. And even now, after Alexei's death, she is very distant, keeps distance between her and Ukraine. Well, right, Vasil, because the story between Navalny's and Ukraine is a difficult one. Ukrainians were taking uh, pokes and laughing at uh, Navalny, remembering bring us vodka for Putin, and uh, they were referencing to the Crimea uh, statement, his Crimea statement as a sandwich. So if you think she does not see that, she does see that. So it would be, it would take certain strength on her to be able to rise above these uh, 
conflicts, squabbles that we have between our uh, countries, between oppositions uh, to regime. But um, again, if she finds it within herself to see that big strategic picture, that will definitely put her as a big political figure on the world scale. But I have to concur, she has not mentioned Ukraine yet. All right, we've been live for about an hour and 10 minutes. So Alexei, thank you so much. Uh, it was interesting and I hope useful for our viewers in both practical and strategic terms. And um, we appreciate this chance to have to ask questions and get answers. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, viewers, for your questions. Please send more for the next week. And again, thank you all for your time and trust. Take care. Ukraine will prevail.